<laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for staying after what I'm sure was quite an emotional ordeal watching the fabulous eclipse. Uh, my name is Tinny Craig. I'm the associate director at the gate, um, and I'm thrilled to introduce Annika van Wittenberg, who is uh, one of the senior researchers at the Human Rights Watch, who's really graciously agreed to talk to us today about a lot of the issues uh, that we've seen in the play, which I imagine we might want to unpick a little bit. Um, so thank you for coming in, Annika. You're I really welcome. appreciate it. Um, I would just love you to elaborate a little bit on what your position is and what your job entails, just uh, those of us who don't know, which includes me to some extent. Sure. So, um, so I'm Annika. I work at Human Rights Watch. And for more than a decade, I was the senior researcher on Central Africa, so the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda. More recently, I'm the Africa Advocacy Director, and so I now cover broader bits of Africa. But I have to say, I... Um, I'm not sure how the rest of you felt, but this this was hard hitting. It was partly hard hitting for me because I have interviewed probably hundreds of child soldiers over my time working for Human Rights Watch, quite a number of whom have been girls. And quite a lot of what I saw this evening, what we all saw this evening, um, struck a struck a, a line of truth. Mm -hmm. You know, this is so much of what was expressed in this play. Uh, bears an extremely close resemblance to the stories I've heard. And we can go into that a little bit. But can mm -hmm. I say just mm -hmm. one thing that, that I, that kind of really, you know, kind of captured my heart on this, and that was the name issue. Because so many armed groups, whether it's in Liberia or across Africa, this is, I don't know if they learn this in warlord school, but there is <laughs> something about immediately removing a young child's identity. And the best way to do that is the name. And so frequently, and these are many of the testimonies I've taken, they're either given a name or sometimes a number, and a number is not unusual, as was the case in the play tonight, and they are told to forget about their family, forget their names, forget their families, forget their home environments. And so that was so touching about the play, is that is really close to reality. And I interviewed one girl, it's one of the many stories that sticks with me. She was a young girl who'd been abducted at the age of 11 by the Lord's Resistance Army, which is another armed group that is very typically targeting children and continues to in Africa. And she'd also been given a name by the armed group. She'd become a wife of one of the leaders. And um, she eventually, in fact, became a soldier, so not too dissimilar to some of the stories here. And um, she was eventually killed in battle, which was particularly sad. But somebody found her flashlight. And in her flashlight, she had a tiny piece of paper that she had rolled up and put inside the flashlight, where she had written her real name over and over and over again. And it's because someone found that little piece of paper rolled up in the flashlight that they actually were able to trace her family and her family got a degree of closure. And uh, what I particularly remember her first name, her name was Elise, but she had written it over and over again, almost as you know, a girl who was desperately trying to hang on to her identity. Mm -hmm. And you saw that coming through in this play and the difficulties around that. Yeah, that's so powerful, mm -hmm. so moving. Um, I think, for me, uh, when I think about these regions and I think about these particular wars, uh, my first thought goes to the women who have been uh, raped or who've been taken as wives, and I think that's a narrative that we hear quite often. But actually, um, I know that I found it quite surprising to hear that there were women who were soldiers in, in that way. It feels like, a, in the play, it feels like quite a subversive move. But I'd really love to know kind of how common that is, how, how often you see women, and especially girls, becoming soldiers. Well, yeah, it's, it's... So first of all, there are tens of thousands of child soldiers across the world still. Um, whether in Africa or Asia or um, in other places. So it remains a huge problem. Mm. Um, it's not something where one can do a census, right? So we don't have a firm number. We don't know precisely how many girls. The estimate is anywhere between 15 to 30 percent of recruited children. And, and when, when Human Rights Watch talks about child soldiers, we mean 18 years or less. 
and there's slightly different international laws on this. So under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, it's under the age of 16. We usually talk, and most international conventions are under the age of 18. But around 15 to 30 percent mm. probably are, are girls. In some conflicts, that's higher. Liberia was a conflict where it was higher. The estimates were between about 20 and 40 percent. Again, no one knows mm. exactly. Um, I would say it's not uncommon for girls to carry weapons and to become fighters within the armed group in which they've been forced to enter, um, abducted, um, brainwashed. Again, it depends a bit on, on the armed group. Um, more often than not, the, the girl's role is most definitely one of um, what is called a wife. And it's interesting, isn't it, how that term sanitizes what the reality is, right? The, the reality is they become effectively almost sex slaves. They're also forced to cook, to clean. Often, you didn't see that so much in this play, but to transport. Armed groups are rarely stable, right? They don't, so they have to move around a lot. Usually it's the girls who do a lot of the portering, the carrying of, of um, the heavy equipment and, and other kinds of things that go with being a member of an armed group. But I would say it's not unusual for girls to be involved in military operations. Um, and many of them will certainly be trained or forced to do so. And in many armed groups where I've documented it, they're, they're also forced to kill. And one of the reasons for that is that is both boys and girls forced to kill is it is the surest and best way to have control over what are often young children. And in a, a number of these armed groups have become very aware that the best age range is usually around 12 to 17 or 18 for those really young ones. They're strong enough at that point. The girls probably are slightly more developed, though I think for many armed groups that doesn't make much of a difference, but they're easier to control.